So for the first time in three months and with you before me, I want to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 3. We are continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew. Today we are looking at the baptism of Jesus. And so this section is in verses 13 through 17. Matthew chapter 3, beginning to read in verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God, and thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Uh, And Lord, in the truest sense, it is a wonderful privilege for us to be together. God, I pray that as we open up your word, that you would open up our minds and that you would open up our eyes to understand what the baptism of Jesus is all about. Spirit of God, I just ask that you would seal these truths to our hearts. And God, that we would leave this place changed and transformed. God, I ask that you'd bless our time of fellowship and that you would just nourish us at this time by your word and spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the passage before us this morning is one that marks the transition from John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. The ministry of John the Baptist is about to be placed in our rearview mirror because Jesus' glorious ministry is on the rise. And this will be no surprise to John because he was sent to point the nation of Israel to Christ by calling them to repent of their sins. And this was the way in which he had prepared people for the coming Messianic kingdom. And so John has fulfilled his ministry. He has fulfilled his calling. He has prepared the way for the Lord. And now Christ is about to walk on that stage that John has prepared for him. And John the Baptist, who is the forerunner of Christ, is on the brink of passing on the baton to the one who will finish the race. Jesus is going to take that baton out of John's hand, and he is going to run a race that no man has ever dreamed of running. From here on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Christ will occupy central stage, and his ministry will be unpacked in a very structural and thematic fashion. Now, it must be said that this account of the baptism of Jesus is in some respects a confusing portion of Scripture because we know that John's baptism was a baptism for repentance to those who had come confessing their sins. And the problem with that is that we know that Jesus was sinless. We know that Jesus was without sin, which seems to indicate that there was no need for Jesus to be baptized by John. According to Jesus, however, it was necessary for him to be baptized. Now, the purpose of Jesus being baptized will be looked at in due course. But for now, there are two things I want us to notice about this passage as a whole. And so as we navigate through this passage, I want to look at it under these two headings. The first thing I want us to consider is the active obedience of Christ And secondly, I want us to consider the consecration of Christ. So let's consider the former, verses 13 through 15. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Now, I don't want to speculate too much concerning the exact relationship John had with Jesus before Jesus came to be baptized by him. Certainly, they were not strangers to one another because we know that they were relatives. And even if they didn't see each other much growing up, it's it's really quite impossible to conceive of Elizabeth never mentioning that incident to her son when Mary had visited her decades earlier. 
And not only that, but we know that John the Baptist himself had leaped for joy in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was probably feeling the wildest kicks and punches a pregnant woman could ever experience and feel when John the Baptist was doing cartwheels within her womb when Mary came to greet her. And so John was aware of Jesus' supernatural birth and that it was more supernatural than his own, and he probably understood that, that Jesus had a greater knowledge of the scriptures that superseded his by a long shot. But at any rate, John was aware of who Jesus was, but his understanding of who he was was only going to be further elevated and confirmed when he bore witness that he was the Son of God when the Spirit of God came to descend upon Christ like a dove. Now, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee to the Jordan, which was about 70 miles away. And so evidently, there was something very important that was motivating Jesus to make this trip. And of course, we know it was to be baptized. But John was confused at this, and rightly so. And he was thinking to himself out loud, uh, what do you mean you need to be baptized by me? I need to be baptized by you. I mean, John had just finished saying that he was unworthy to carry his sandals, and now the very one that he was unworthy to even be a slave of is coming to him for baptism. You see, what wasn't making any sense in John's mind uh, was that this was a baptism for repentance. This was a baptism for people that are sinful. This was a baptism... <laughs> for people who had come confessing their sins. And therefore, he thought, Jesus, you must baptize me because I am a sinful man. But in you, there is no sin to be detected. I mean, can you imagine being in the presence of a person that is sinless? I mean, someone who is perfect. And not just someone who thinks that they are perfect, but someone who is actually perfect. Don't you think you would notice it? Wouldn't it stand out to you? Because think about it. One of the problems we have as sinners is that it is so easy for us to pick out sin in someone else. It is far more easy for us to spot uh, weaknesses and sinful problems within our friends and our children and our spouse, spouses and just about everyone more than we detect it in ourselves. Our problem is that we are prone uh, to, to spot weaknesses in others because it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. We all have sin, and because we do, it's not too difficult for us to find something wrong in someone else. But can you imagine being in the presence of unvarnished holiness, total innocence, and complete perfection? Now, you might still try to find something wrong with such a person like that, uh, because we know that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. And we know that they were doing everything that they could to find something wrong, just something small wrong with Jesus that they might accuse him of. And man, from what we know in the Gospels, they were really stretching things and blowing things out of proportion. But time and time again, their silly little games were turned on their heads. But when John the Baptist was in the presence of Christ, John didn't see any sin in him, but he did see sin in himself. And isn't that true for us? That when we are in the presence of Christ and God manifests his presence to us, we see sin in ourselves. And we are humbled by his majesty. And the very question posed by John the Baptist to Jesus suggests that Jesus was sinless because there was no need for him to be baptized. And John saw that he was unworthy to perform this task, and that also tells us that Jesus being baptized by John was for a different reason than all the others that were baptized by him. So we need to ask the question, what was he baptized for if it wasn't for repentance? Well, verse 15 tells us why. Look at what it says. It says, But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill 
all righteousness. And then he consented. You see, the reason why Jesus was baptized was so that he would fulfill all righteousness, which demonstrates this, that this is for a uniquely different purpose. But what does fulfilling all righteousness even mean? Well, when we look at the way that Matthew has previously spoke about Jesus fulfilling things, it has always been in reference to Scripture. We have heard him say things like, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, or then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Or another example is, for so it is written by the prophet. There is this constant appeal to the prophets or to Scripture. You see, in these statements, in, in, in Matthew appealing to the Old Testament Scriptures, Matthew was showing us that Jesus fulfills the Scriptures inasmuch as the Scriptures had pointed forward to Christ. But here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, it is different because there is not an appeal to any specific prophecy of Scripture, but rather an appeal to the demands of Scripture, which are the demands of God. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness by keeping the law to perfection. Now, this is what we call the active obedience of Christ, and we use that phrase to distinguish it from Jesus' passive obedience. The active obedience of Christ is Jesus actively fulfilling the law of God in his life, and his passive obedience is when he passively yields himself to the will of the Father, or he yields himself and gives himself into the hands of sinners to die upon the cross. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness by fulfilling the law. And this is essential to your salvation. Because we are not only saved by the death of Christ, we are also saved by the life of Christ. And it is his life of obedience that saves us from our life of disobedience. And that is critical. And here's why. God demands righteousness. And not the kind of righteousness that people like to talk about, right? Many people think that they are good, but in God's estimation, we have all miserably failed because we have broken His law. Unrighteousness is to actively disobey or live in disobedience. Righteousness is to actively obey or live in obedience. And therefore, none of us can say that we have fulfilled all righteousness, unless, of course, you are claiming the righteousness of another. And there is only one other person to cling to for that. There is only one covenant keeper. There is only one true law-abiding citizen, and it is Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When Jesus was born into this world, he was born under the law. That is, he was born under the obligation to keep all the requirements of the law without ever failing so that he would procure a righteousness for all those who trust in him. But throughout the entirety of his life, the law was screaming and it was saying, keep me or fail at one point and you will be condemned. But Jesus remained faithful the whole way through. And that is why if, that when we are in Christ, we are no longer under law, but we are under grace. The Old Testament made it clear that the Messiah was to be a Jew who would obey the will of God as it was expressed in the Mosaic Code. So to state things simply, Jesus needed to keep all of God's commandments during his life in order for him to be qualified to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world in his death. And so not only was Jesus sinless, but he was righteous. And there is a difference between the two. To be sinless is to do nothing wrong. But to be righteous is to do what is right. Now think about it. 
Not only was there a time when Jesus never did anything wrong, but he always did exactly what was the right thing to do. And that's really quite remarkable to think about. And so Jesus fulfilled all righteousness, and he did so because it was necessary for our salvation. And friends, this is what the gospel is all about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, again the apostle Paul writes, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God The righteousness that God demands was kept for us by Christ, and we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus is our righteousness because he has fulfilled the law of God on our behalf. Jesus knew no sin, but he became sin on the cross, and God judged him for it. And in return, God gave you the righteousness of his son in replacement for your sin when you trusted in his name. And this is what gives us our right standing before God. It is not your righteousness. It is his, and it is freely given to all those who repent and believe in the good news of the gospel And oh, how it belittles the life of Christ when someone says, I don't need his life because my life is doing pretty good right now. I'm doing just fine. And God must be pleased with me. Surely all the accomplishments and all the sacrifices that I have made will be enough. God sees my heart and so surely he will accept me. But friends, there is only one whom God accepts. And there is only one in whom the Father is well pleased, and that is His one and only beloved Son. And therefore, outside of Christ, the only thing that God sees in you and in me is rot and pride and darkness. And it is blasphemous thinking to suppose that God will accept us on the basis of anything other than the labors of Jesus Christ. But what amazing news it is to know that Jesus has provided a perfect righteousness for us and it is freely given, again, to all those who believe. The way of salvation is forsaking your own empty righteousness by holding on to another. For the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, why was Jesus baptized? It was to fulfill all righteousness. Now, I think it's also worthy to note that some have taken issue with, the interpreta- with this interpretation because there is no law in the Old Testament that would give any indication that Jesus, the Messiah, or anybody else for that matter, was to be baptized. But that is overlooking something of vast importance which is that the law and the prophets came to an end with John. And therefore, the new requirement that John the Baptist made for all Israel, that all the Jews were to be baptized, necessitated that Jesus be baptized as well. God's will in the old was finally expressed through John, and therefore Jesus was under the obligation to submit to John's baptism. But again... Jesus being baptized was for a unique purpose and even served as an emblem of what he came to do insofar as this baptism identified Jesus with sinners, although he himself was no sinner. You see, just as Jesus humbled himself by descending from heaven and was born in the likeness of men, and came to live in a world that is stained by sin, yet he did so while being untouched by sin. And so it was of his baptism. He humbly submitted to John's baptism, which identified him with those he came to save, even though he himself was in no need of repentance. Leon Morris has said this. He says, Jesus might well have been up there in front, standing with John and calling on sinners to repent. Instead, 
He was down there with the sinners, affirming his solidarity with them, making himself one with them in the process of the salvation he would in due course accomplish. When John's ministry was in full swing, Jesus began his ministry with an act of self-humiliation. The state of Christ's humiliation was formally and publicly seen when he willingly went down into the waters of baptism. And this act of self-humiliation that struck and even surprised John was an act that typified the ultimate act of self-humiliation that he would endure three and a half years later. In Luke chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus told his disciples, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. From the very installation of Christ's ministry, he had his eyes focused on the end, and that end was the cross where he would willingly identify himself with sinners by bearing our sin, and by bearing our guilt, and by bearing our shame. But just as Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, so he came bursting forth from the grave to bury our sin once and for all. Jesus came out on top. And he came out victorious. Well, we've considered the act of obedience of Christ. And I want us to now consider the consecration of Christ in verses 16 and 17. It says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Have you ever wondered what it means that the heavens were open to him? Does that in some way mean that the clouds broke apart or that our solar system was divided? Well, we're probably not to think about it in those terms. There were other occasions in Scripture where the heavens were open to certain individuals. For example, we might think of the call of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, in the very first verse, it says, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chabar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. You see, on this occasion, God spoke to Ezekiel through a visionary experience in which he called him to serve as a prophet. And in order for Ezekiel to fulfill his prophetic role, God placed him on his feet and God placed his spirit upon him in the very next chapter. Now, another example of this, and there are many examples, but another example of the heavens being open to someone was Stephen when he was being martyred in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 56, it says, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The fact that not everyone was able to see what these individuals got to see indicates that we are not talking about something earthy. It is a heavenly or a visionary experience in which God pulls back the curtain to unveil himself and his plan in a pictorial way. And so Jesus sees the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. Now, what significance the dove bears in relationship to the Holy Spirit in this context cannot be settled with certainty. But in Scripture, we do know that the dove represents purity and delight and innocency. Now, it may also be that there is a twofold illusion Matthew has in mind, that being the story of the flood in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Remember, the dove was the creature that returned to Noah with good news by bringing an olive leaf, which indicated to Noah that the waters of the flood were subsiding. And when that idea is coupled with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which tells us that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, 
The implication to draw might be that the Spirit coming to hover over Christ like a dove is meant to indicate that a new creation and the ultimate good news has come. But whatever significance there was in the dove, the point was that it was to symbolize the Spirit's descent upon Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus was without the Spirit before his baptism, but at his baptism, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit visited him in this new and fresh way so that he would be endowed with power for his upcoming ministry. The coming of the Spirit of God to rest on Christ, in effect, set him apart and consecrated him unto God that he might fulfill his messianic role in being the suffering servant that the prophets had foretold. The prophet Isaiah makes mention of this reality in several places, but a notable one worthy of mentioning here is Isaiah chapter 11. And I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 11 and look at verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 11, beginning to read in verse 1. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Well, when we look at the ministry of Christ, we cannot help but see these qualities exhibited in his life to perfection. Was not Jesus filled with wisdom and understanding? He absolutely was. He always knew when to speak and when not to speak. And not only that, but when he spoke, he spoke with authority, he spoke the truth, and he spoke in love. He was the most persuasive speaker, for he was filled with wisdom and understanding. And he was also the best counselor. He didn't just offer advice, he advised people what to do. He met them where they were and led them in the right direction, and he even redirected their lives by transforming them by the power of God. Jesus had a fear of the Lord which led him to carry out his Father's will to perfection. Jesus was filled with wisdom. He was filled with understanding and counsel and might because the Spirit of God rested upon him and he yielded his life to the control of the Holy Spirit like no other. Well, the Spirit, or when the Spirit of God rested on Christ at his baptism, that was the event that inaugurated his ministry. The Spirit of God came to empower Christ for his public ministry, and his own Father bore witness to it. Look at verse 17. It says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. With him... I am well pleased, or with whom I am well pleased. Now, I can only imagine how these words would have been extremely encouraging to Jesus at the outset of his ministry. I mean, isn't it so strengthening to be encouraged from your father? I can remember growing up and doing certain things in uh, growing up that my father would encourage me in, and it would, it would strengthen me. When I grew up, I was really into sports, as you know, and so was my dad. And I knew that whenever he came to watch one of my games, whether it was hockey or whether it was soccer, I always knew that he was really watching and paying attention to the details of the game. And I mean, my mom was always encouraging too, but she would have encouraged me with playing a good game even if I really didn't. (laughs) But when my dad encouraged me over a play I made, it carried a little more weight because He really understood the game. And when you are sincerely being encouraged by someone who really notices something about you or something you did, doesn't it strengthen you and give you confidence to move forward? Well, before Jesus is about to enter into the three and a half most difficult years of his life, his father encourages him and says, son, I love you. 
And I want you to know that I am so well pleased with you. This was the voice of God the Father in heaven, and it authenticated and confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah. Because this is recalling a couple of passages in the Old Testament, such as Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, that reads, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. It also recalls Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, that says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Once again, Matthew is proving to the Jews that Jesus was the person in view in those passages. He is the Messianic King who, who happens to be the servant of the Lord and the Son of God. And in case they had any doubts, he reminds them that Jesus has the stamp of approval from heaven itself. Now, I believe it is also important for me to highlight at this point the amount of importance this passage has uh, on the baptism of Christ or, or how this passage um, has had such importance in the history of the church in defending the Christian and the orthodox and the biblical view of God. We know from Scripture that there is one God. The Bible makes that clear in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So there is one God, but the Bible reveals that there are interpersonal relationships uh, that fellowship within or, or fellowship in, with, in unity within the Godhead. And this has come to be known as the, the doctrine of the Trinity. The God of the Bible is a triune God. There are different members in the Godhead. There is the Father, and there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. There is only one being, but there are three persons who share in the essence of deity. Now, in saying that, let me remind you that God is God. Okay, so all that he is is far beyond what our finite minds are able to comprehend. We cannot fully grasp or exhaust all that there is to know about God. But it is also not a contradiction because we are not saying that there is one God and then turning our cheeks to say that there are three gods. There is only one God who exists in three persons, which puts this in the category of mystery. So let me give you a simple mathematical equation to compare it with the Trinity, okay? So we shouldn't think of the Trinity in this way. One plus one plus one equals three. Because this would give us three persons, but it would also give us three gods because the additional numbers are adding to each other. Here you have plurality, but you have no unity. The Trinity, however, is really a triunity. There must be plurality within unity. So it might be better to think about it in these terms. One times one times one equals... One, you guys are really good. <laughs> you see, this equation would give us three separate persons, but it would give us one God where each person shares in the sum total of the being of God. Now, I recognize that pretty much every example breaks down at some point, but I only lay that before you so that we can grab hold of the biblical notion that there is one God who simultaneously exists in three persons. And at the baptism of Christ, we see each member of the Trinity at the same time. The Father is the one who speaks from heaven. The Son is the one to whom the Father speaks, and He is the one who is being baptized. And the Spirit of God is the one who comes to rest upon Christ. And that's important to recognize because some people have this idea that God just changes modes, and it's called modalism. And there are different forms of modalism and it's still being propagated in some circles today, where sometimes God reveals himself as Father, sometimes he reveals himself as Son, sometimes he reveals himself as the Holy Spirit, but God is just always kind of putting on a new mask. But that is not true. God is revealed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and each member is co-eternal and co-equal with one another. 
The Father authorized the Son and sent Him into this world. The Son willingly obeyed His Father in coming into this world to accomplish His mission, which was to purchase salvation uh, by dying on the cross for our sins. And the Spirit of God applies that salvation to our hearts by giving us spiritual life in Christ. And now, because of what Christ has done, we all have access to the Father in one spirit. Well, may we give thanks to our great God for all that we learn at the baptism of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful account. We thank you for being baptized. We thank you for fulfilling all righteousness, for doing everything that was required in order for us to be saved. Now, we thank you uh, that we are saved uh, on the basis of your obedience and not our own. Otherwise, we would have uh, no way to stand before you. So, God, we thank you for Christ. We pray that he would be glorified. And, Lord, as we just sing this last hymn, we ask, O oh God, that you'd be at work in our hearts. Um, and, Lord, that we would truly worship you in spirit and truth. I thank you so much for your people. Uh, I pray that you bless them and greatly encourage them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.